Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank the organizers for the honor of being invited to address this very prestigious symposium. But before I start, I'd like to just to, to make a comment about the last presentation given by Professor Tuberson. I think every time I see Dave, or he, listen to David, one word comes to mind, and that is wow. And I think if there are going to be advances in the treatment of pancreas cancer over the next uh, decade or so, I think David is going to be certainly in the vanguard of that. But what I'd like to do is to change tack a little bit and to talk uh, to you on a more clinical note on the uh, surgical management of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Now, these are relatively rare tumors. Uh, they account for approximately uh, 0 0.4 per 100,000. So, and we see about uh, one to 2% of all pancreatic tumors. Where I come from the Republic of Ireland, a population of five million, we'll see between 35 and 40 new cases a year. So I suspect in the UAE that would be double. The actual instance has doubled in the last 20 years, and this is in part due to increased physician awareness, it's in part due to increased imaging, and it's in part due to improvement in that imaging. The instance as shown here in the SEER data from the United States has been increasing. The blue line reflects the uh, instance of cancer. The red line shows the uh, increased instance of neuroendocrine tumors. And when one breaks that down between uh, the various different types, as you can see on the right-hand side, the United States data, the left-hand side, the United Kingdom data, uh, you can see that the majority of these have been seen, this increase has been seen in small intestinal and stomach lesions. However, pancreas is increasing over the time. 10% of these tumors are associated with a syndrome, and I'll speak a little bit more about MEN1 disease later, but MEN4, von hitler lindau tuberous fibrosis, and tuberous sclerosis are also seen, albeit rather rarely. From a surgical point of view and from a phys physician's point of view, and we see the patients, we classify these uh, the non-genetic um, uh, tumors into really whether they're functional, i.e. producing hormones, or whether they have non-functional status with no hormone-related clinical features. The functional tumors um, are, as listed here, in the main carcinoid gastronomas, insulinomas, glucagonomas, and BIPomas, and those other rare uh, diseases. When we look at their incidence, the vast majority of the patients that we see in clinical practice are non-functioning tumors, uh, with various small amounts of patients uh, being seen by insulinomas. In Ireland, we'll see between one or two new patients with insulinomas uh, a year. Now, the majority of, of non-functioning tumors are actually benign, although this is rather questionable, and 100% are, are located in the pancreas in contradistinction to some of the uh, functioning tumors uh, which are cited in other diseases. Now, their grading system is, is utilized. There are three major grading systems that are used. Most of us now are using the WHO 2010 grading system, which grades tumors on the basis of their KI-67 index, their mitotic count, differentiation. And this, as you can see, the survival rate relates very nicely to this, with an 85% five-year survival, roughly with grade one tumors, and down to less than 10% with grade three. ENETS has a more classical uh, system, which takes the uh, tumor node and metastasis model. And in 2002, we published a, a, a grading system which uh, looked at necrosis as well as the combination of mitotic indexes for high-grade feed. Uh, a recent paper actually in the American Journal of Pathology demonstrated that if you take KI-67 and include the Hochwald classification, that it's one of the best systems for looking at recurrence-free survival. Nonetheless, what I'm going to speak to in the next the remainder of the talk is using the WHO classification, which basically grades tumors into neuroendocrine tumors, which are either grade one with a KI-67 of less than 2%, grade two with KI-67 of greater than 2% but less than 20%, and neuroendocrine carcinoma, which is grade three, uh, with KI-67 of uh, greater than 20%. But I'm really gonna focus the rest of the talk on the G1 and G2 uh, tumors. Now, the aim of therapy um, in, in this disease is twofold. In the functional tumors, it's obviously to control symptoms, uh, the endocrine symptoms. In the non-functioning tumors, it's to control symptoms of uh, organ dysfunction, such as duodenal obstruction or colonic obstruction, and secondly, to inhibit tuber growth. And we have a myriad of different uh, modalities at our disposal in 2016, from hormonal therapy, chemotherapy, chemoembolization therapy, 
uh, peptide receptor re radionucleotide treatment and immunotherapy. But the aim of my talk this afternoon is to discuss the role of surgical therapy. And I'm really going to focus on localized disease, but I'm also going to spend a little bit of time talking about how we deal with advanced disease and some of the roles of surgery in that, in that space. And if you think about surgery and stand back on the balcony, the aim of a surgical procedure, be it in localized disease or in metastatic disease, is at best to try to get a complete resection or at least get optimal debulking greater than 90%. And obviously, if the patient has symptoms, be it pressure symptoms, be it local symptoms of the tumor or functional symptoms, we want to resolve those symptoms. But we want to do so with an operation that preserves functionality and minimizes mortality and morbidity. So the first thing we have to take into account is what type of patient we're dealing with and what's the age range of the patient and the functional status of the patient. Are we dealing with the young man sitting there looking at his smartphone with a baseball cap or are we dealing with someone who looks a little bit like me, I suppose, at this stage, um, who is, is, is uh, on in life? And I think this is very important as we, we go through any of the discussion that I'm about to have has to take this as a kernel point. Now, we are lucky with neuroendocrine tumors that there are a lot of consensus guidelines that have been published both in in uh, Europe as well as in uh, North America. The common one that we use in, in Europe um, and in the Middle East will be the ENETS guidelines. And these are the ones that were published this year in 2016, earlier in the year in Europe, uh, endocrinology by Massimo Falconi and his colleagues. And basically, if you take the clinical presentation and the typical presentation of someone who comes with a mass in the pancreas, biochemistry is checked, including chromogranin A and uh, poly uh, pancreatic polypeptide, and then the diagnosis is generally based on imaging uh, with, the, with the common axial images, uh, CT and MRI, EUS then with the fine needle aspiration, and then somatostatin receptor imaging. So at the end of that, we come to a, a situation that we've got a resectable condition with no distal metastasis versus unresectable metastatic disease. Now, if the tumor is less than two centimeters and the patient has a G1 or possibly a G2 tumor, there's a case for make for surveillance. However, if the, if the patient has a G2 tumor or a larger tumor greater than two centimeters or is symptomatic, we are inclined to move to surgery. And I think most people would accept this as a, as a relatively uh, reasonable classification. So the question is, is when to operate. These are two cases. You can see on the right-hand side, you've got a patient who has, and the painter is a bit hard, is a small unsner process. This is an arterial phase CT scan, and you can see a hyperechoic lesion here in the, in the, in the unsner process. And this is less than two centimeters. But I will note that there are two lymph nodes there, and I'll come back to this patient in a moment. And this lesion here, which is a three centimeter lesion, also in the unsner process. And as you can see, the patient is in this, this is the early arterial phase. And you can see just there, there's a biliary stent in situ. So this patient had presented with obstructive jaundice. So currently, surgery is the only curative therapy for these conditions. And as I've mentioned, patient selection is key. We need to understand whether we're dealing with functional versus non-functional, and generally, tumors less than two centimeters we'll observe, particularly if they're grade one. Tumors greater than two centimeters are those in which there's a suggestion of metastatic disease we will take to the operating room. And the location of the tumor dictates the procedure that we do, be it open or now laparoscopic, or in some cases, robotic surgery. So if you have a tumor with it, if you have a tumor which is in the uh, triangle here uh, of the so-called duodenal or uh, endocrine triangle, these patients will either be suitable for nucleation if it's away from the pancreatic duct or a segmental resection. And in the main, this will, be, this will require a pancreatic duodenectomy or occasionally we'll do a duodenal preserving uh, head resection. If obviously the, the tumor is closer to the body of the tumor, then a central pancreatectomy or in some cases a, a, a distal pancreatectomy and at the tail, it will either be a distal pancreatectomy plus or minus splenectomy. And these can either be done by open surgery or by laparoscopic surgery. And this is just an example of one patient that we published a number of years ago. This patient had, a, as you can see, the hyperechoic tumor. Here it is seen in endoscopic ultrasound. The patient had a needle biopsy. This was felt to be an insulinoma. Biochemically, this patient had an insulinoma. The patient had a grade one disease. It's well uh, circumscribed. The reason we didn't do any nucleation is the pancreatic duct was running right beside it. And so we resected this, um, in this case, with an open operation. Now we would do a uh, laparoscopic procedure. The tail of the gland was rather atrophic, and so therefore we didn't do a central pancreatectomy. We went for a splenic preserving distal pancreatectomy. And here you can see the typical appearance of an insulinoma. 
Now we've been very, over the last decade or decade and a half, not only have we become uh, um, expertise at doing the pancreatic resections, but we've also began to understand the mortality and morbidity that goes with it. So if you take a pancreatic odontectomy, in most uh, centers, the mortality is going to be less than 3%. In our own unit, it's less than 1%. For distal pancreatectomies and the other operations, the mortality is similarly decreased. However, when we look at the morbidity and the, mor and the exocrine and endocrine insufficiency, you see a different story. Now, clearly, when you do a total pancreatectomy, everybody's exocrine and endocrine insufficient. However, with a, a pancreatic odontectomy, particularly if we have longer survivors, we see higher rates of exocrine and endocrine insufficiency. Uh, up to the figure of 60% for exocrine insufficiency and endocrine insufficiency of up to about a quarter of patients. And if you actually look for these, the, the, in, this in, in patients, you actually find more of it. Whereas in central pancreatectomy and enucleation, the range of exocrine and endocrine insufficiency is less than 5%. So very often in these group of patients who will live a long time, we're trying to do more pancreatic sparing procedures. But it comes at a cost. And this is, I think, a very good story uh, from Jacques Delbetti's group in Beaujon. It was a retrospective case study between 2000 and 2012, and they had 100 patients. And you can see the majority of these patients have a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. And when you look at the complications, the morbidity occurred in 72% of the patients. And when you looked at the major cause of morbidity, it was pancreatic uh, fistula. And so when you looked at the type of fistula, the majority of these patients had either a B or a C fistula. So significant fistula that causes significant morbidity. What was also interesting when they looked at the long-term complications, they found that almost 10% of their patients had some form of a long-term complication. And what they also found was that there was some, pre, there was some evidence of uh, clinically significant pancreatic exocrine insufficiency in about 6% of cases. And this is very similar to the literature at that time. Because if you look at the pancreatic insufficiency following a central pancreatic resection, with a median follow-up of only six months, that figure is between five and six percent. It increases somewhat, but certainly not as much as would occur with a segmental distal pancreatectomy or pancreatic adrotinectomy. So we believe that this is, a, this is a, a appropriate operation to do in, in selected patients. Now what of laparoscopic surgery? There's lots of papers that can be produced regarding laparoscopic surgery. I highlight this one, which is produced by uh, Leonor, uh, uh, Fernandez Cruz from Barcelona, one of, the, one of the pioneers of developing laparoscopic surgery, particularly for uh, neuroendocrine tumors. And this was his early publication in 2008, where he had 49 patients in whom he did laparoscopic surgery with very interesting and very successful results. What he showed, though, however, was depending on what type of procedure, your complication rate increased. For instance, if you did an enucleation, you were more likely to have a higher rate of pancreatic fistula versus a splenic preserving distal pancreatectomy or an en bloc splenopancreatectomy. It's exactly what you'd expect. And because they had a higher complication rate, the overall uh, postoperative recovery was also longer. Nonetheless, there have been a number of studies which have shown that laparoscopic surgery is safe in this patient population albeit in this pub pa paper published a number of years ago, showed that three-quarters of patients still receive an open operation uh, versus a laparoscopic operation. But this is definitely increasing. What we know from laparoscopic surgery is that hospital stay is decreased, blood loss is re reduced. There really is no difference in terms of post-operative pancreatic fistula, which you'd expect. Operative time, actually, once you get past the learning curve, is much similar. In our own institution, actually, laparoscopic surgery is quicker. The mortality rates are similar but the overall complication rate is decreased. And this relates to the uh, lack of wound infection and lack of uh, pulmonary complications. But as I mentioned, the pancreatic fistula rate is much the same. So if you do laparoscopic surgery, should you continue to do a lymphadenectomy? And I would argue the answer is yes. And this is the patient I showed you at the very beginning with a small onset tumor and those two little nodes back down there. Now, that patient had a open uh, pancreatic odontectomy, in fact, and a, a lymphadenectomy, and those nodes were positive for tumor. And we know when we look at the, at the data, and this is now from Emory University in the United States, published earlier this year, looking at um, 131 patients who underwent a lymphadenectomy as part of a resection for neuroendocrine tumor, 24% were positive. And when you looked at the, at the reason for positivity, it was male gender, it was disease in the head of the gland, and it was a tumor size greater than two centimeters, things you would actually expect. Colleagues from, from Washington University in St. Louis looked at 136 patients. Again, about a third of patients were node positive, 
and they showed us what you'd expect, that if your KI67 rate was higher, if your tumor was larger, uh, you were going to have a higher rate of node positivity. It was interesting that there was really no difference between whether the head or the body, uh, the tumors were in the head of the body. And what they also showed was if you had a patient who had a, a lymph node positivity, they did worse than the patients with lymph node uh, uh, negativity. So the question is, is what is the impact of, of uh, lymphadenectomy? And this is published from the, from the uh, Anderson group uh, earlier on this year. Well, they, had, they identified in the SEER database 5,000 patients who underwent resection, and they could, out of that they could get 900 patients who had a lymphadenectomy. The majority of patients had either grade one or grade tumor, as you'd expect, and no positivity was present in, in, tumor, in, in relation to tumor size, the grade of the tumor, and particularly grade, grade, greater than grade two. Now, if you looked at this data, it was interesting because you saw an improvement in overall survival in patients who were T1 or T2, and an over and disease-specific survival in T1 and T2 tumors if they had a lymphadenectomy, but you didn't in T3 or T4 tumors, and suggesting that the biological pathway, the natural history of the disease, impacts on whether or not a lymphadenectomy would be of use for, for this patient population. So quite intriguing data. What they also showed from an, a separate analysis was when they looked at a, a separate group of patients who had lymphadenectomy, they found that surgery plus a lymphadenectomy increased the disease-free survival in patients who had larger tumors. And what you can see in the, in the red there was the tumors between two and four centimeters, the survival increased from 84 uh, uh, to 84% and greater than four tum uh, centimeter tumors. It was less of a difference, but there was a difference nonetheless. Now, briefly, just to mention MEN disease, as you know, this occurs in the pituitary, parathyroid, and pancreatic islets, and there are also some other foreground uh, neuroendocrine tumors. And the majority of the, of the gastroenteropancreatic tumors are functioning. However, 20% of them will be non-functioning as well. Now, the surgical history of this is, is, is quite interesting because these tumors are multifocal. They're throughout the gland, and rarely will you ever get a situation where you render this person disease-free. So what you're really trying to do is to actually uh, alter the natural history of the disease. And this is from Kuvarki and others uh, and, uh, in, uh, 10 years ago, and they showed in selected groups of patients that if you resect patients and have a resection, that the natural history is altered and appears to, appears to be improved. But this is a very selective, selected group of patients, and there undoubtedly is a treatment bias there. Um, from this, what you want to really note is that the median survival, irrespective of the, both the groups, uh, and both for, for, for progression-free survival and overall survival, is very large, from 12 to 19 years. So these patients live for a long time. So it is very difficult to understand whether or not, in MEN, you're actually doing, making a difference. It is also important to understand that this comes with a cost to patients, and the cost is similar to operating in patients with other diseases of the pancreas. In other words, there is a significant uh, uh, morbidity uh, associated with this operation um, in terms of both pancreatic fistula, delayed uh, gastric emptying, and uh, mortality. So this is our practice for dealing with MEN uh, disease. Once we make the decide, decision for the disease, once we have a, a once we com confirm that there's no extra pancreatic disease, um, we will then determine on the size and the grade of the tumor, much with non-functioning tumors. So if you have a greater than two centimeter tumor, we are inclined to operate. If they're multifocal disease, we will try as best to grossly render the patient disease-free, although we understand that there is going to be micro uh, metastatic disease or micro disease within the pancreas. Now, in the last few minutes, what about this type of patient? This is a head of, of pancreas neuroendocrine tumor in a sporadic uh, patient with a, with a non-functioning neuroendocrine tumor who has multiple liver metastases, as you can see there. Very young patient, 45 years of age, patient presented with significant pain, weight loss, and cachexia. And then we have this patient who's a 71-year-old, 70-year-old patient who's the wife of a general practitioner who had an excellent performance status had a, an episode of abdominal discomfort and maybe early satiety, and because she was the wife of a general practitioner, she went and had an ultrasound. The ultrasound showed that she had multiple lesions within the liver and this very large mass in her abdomen. And then after the ultrasound, someone examined her, and you could easily palpate this mass. And as you can clearly see that she has perigastric varices, her spleen is enlarged, and this is a rather large uh, mass. 
And so the question is, is what should we do with this patient who sits in front of you very well with a very large palpable mass in the, in the uh, left upper quadrant? Now, there is some data to bring to bear on these two patients. And this is a systematic review that was done by the group in Verona and published a number of years ago. They started with a lot of publications, 3,000 publications, and they ended up with three publications. So it's not a commonly written about uh, topic. But what they showed was, and again, the numbers are small between the three studies. So you're talking about a little less than 200 patients. Um, again, what they showed was the vast majority of patients in these studies had not their, had their primary left in situ, but 20% of the patients had um, their primary resected. And when you looked at them, the first one showed that the, that the five year survival wasn't changed, um, but there was a huge change in symptom improvement. So these were clearly selected patients who were, had locally advanced symptoms. In the other two stories, it was very interesting because the five year survival in the patients resected appeared to be greater. And again, you can argue this is a very selective population. These patients may have had different performance status, but nonetheless, there's a little key there that maybe, maybe it, it could be improving. So a group from Washington University and others looked at the SEER database, and they identified 882 patients. And what they saw in the patients who had their primary resected in, in the face of metastatic disease was that they were younger patients, they had lower grade, and it was more likely that the tumor was going to be in the body and tail of the gland, things you'd expect. What they also showed is when they did a number of survival uh, uh, analysis, what they showed was if the tumor grade was low, if they were young patients, if they were diagnosed after 2003, if the tumor was in the body of the gland, and if they had their, their uh, primary tumor resected, that the survival was better. And these are the curves showing on the left-hand side here grade, uh, age, location, lymph node, etc. Interesting here, this was the patients, if they had not only the primary tumor, but if they had their metastatic disease uh, resected. And as you can see, this, did not this was close to, but not statistically significant, which is also intriguing. Data from the M Milan group, again, showing that, again, that if you resect the primary in this presence of metastatic disease, that the overall survival is, is different. The reason I put this up is because I think it's interesting because they alluded to this fact that if you resected the primary and then treated the liver, and because most of these patients have metastatic disease within the liver, with peptide uh, uh, receptor radionucleotide therapy, that you actually improve the survival further. And subsequently, they had a further publication which updated this. So they had 31 patients who underwent resection. The majority of patients underwent the distal pancreatectomy, although there were seven uh, pancreatic duodenectomies and one total pancreatectomy. Median follow-up was 51 months, so a reasonable follow-up, and the median progression-free survival was doubled from 30 months to 70 months, suggesting that, pati that, that patients who have a primary in situ with liver-only metastatic disease may benefit from aggressive therapy of the primary tumor plus aggressive therapy of the, um, of the liver. Now, this is peptide uh, radionucleotide therapy, but there has been some other data showing that TACE and Sertex therapy can offer the same type of, of, of result. So what did we do for this patient? Well, this patient is still alive. This, was, this, this scan was, was two years ago. Uh, he's doing well. He's on somatostatin analogs. He's had chemotherapy. Um, and so he's actually doing, doing quite well. Uh, he's alive with the disease with a reasonable performance status. How long that will last is, is, difficult, is difficult to ascertain. This, young, this lady had her primary uh, resected. She was then treated with, with uh, capsi capsitabine telosomide chemotherapy, and she's alive with disease, but again, with an excellent per, uh, uh, performance status, and she's now 18 months out from, from the condition. And it's very interesting. She says that, her, that she feels better now, and it's, it's, she had the procedure uh, which removed this, and we often wonder whether or not she would have run into tr problems with these perigastric varices. So in summary, what do, we, what do we do for these patients? Well, I think the functional tumors depends on, on the extent of the disease and the symptoms, and we generally try to operate in those patients, but I haven't really talked about that during this talk. For the non-functional tumors, it relates to the size, the grade, and the symptoms of the patient. In general, we try to perform a pancreas sparing procedure. We try for splenic preservation. 
Whether we use laparoscopic or open depends on the site of the, the, the tumor and also whether or not the grade would suggest that we were going to have, or the size of the tumor would suggest that we want to do an extended lymphadenectomy. Open pancreatectomy remains the gold standard for disease to the uh, right of the portal vein. And in my opinion, lymphadenectomy is, is indicated in all B2 tumors and tumors that are greater than uh, two centimeters. But I would like to quote from uh, Blake Cady, who was a surgeon um, initially in, in, in the Harvard group and then in Brown, um, who I think he wrote this uh, regarding melanoma. But I actually think it applies very nicely to pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. I think biology is the king, and we've heard that from David Tuberson today in terms of pancreatic adenocarcinoma, but it clearly is the same for neuroendocrine tumors. I think how we select our patients is certainly the queen. And I think when we come to the surgical procedures, be it open, laparoscopic, central pancreatectomy, pancreas sparing, and nucleation, et cetera, et cetera, these are really the princess and princesses of the line. And so biology is where we have to really uh, uh, concentrate going forward. I'd like to thank you uh, for, the, for the privilege of the floor and for your attention. Thank you very much.